Okay, grab your message notes. We are diving into the weirdest book in the Bible, the strangest book in the Bible, the most shocking book in the Bible. What's in it? Uh -huh. Let me give you a little outline here. Right on the front deal here is this. The, the, in chapter 1, God commands Hosea to marry a hooker. I am not making this up. Commands Hosea to marry a prostitute. It gets worse. Her name is Gomer. <laughs> then she continues, she continues to be a prostitute. Three children are born, most of them not Hosea's. Uh, Hosea's wife is then sold into slavery, and Hosea then buys her back. And people, that's just the first three chapters. Has anybody ever heard of a guy named Jerry Springer? <laughs> Have, raise your hand if you've ever watched Jerry Springer. This is a bad sign, okay? Uh, raise your hand if you've never watched Jerry Springer. Okay, Christians, good job. Now, um, I went on Jerry Springer's website just to see what was coming up. August 28th, surprise, I'm cheating. Angela will tell her longtime boyfriend she's been cheating on him, and now she's pregnant. Despite this, she's confident he'll stay with her. Two days later, August 30th, prostitution sex scandals. This is unbelievable. Lisa has secretly been working as an escort at a prostitute to help pay for her wedding. But she now likes her new job, and she's here today to tell her fiancé she's going to continue that work after they're married. <laughs> Hosea and Gomer would have made a great Jerry Springer show. Matter of fact, we wrote the copy. Here it is. September 1st, Jerry Springer. Pastor marries a prostitute. Pastor's wife cheats on him. His children belong to three other men. After selling herself to everyone in town, Gomer ends up as a slave. Her husband, Hosea, buys her back for $15. He claims she knew she would be unfaithful to him in the beginning, but God told him to marry her. God also told him to buy her out of slavery and love her again, coming to Jerry Springer. Doesn't that sound like a fits on a Jerry Springer show? Okay, now, what in the world is going on with this book in the Bible? Okay, now, first, I'm going to put a chart up here so you know who it's written to. Check it out, okay? There were, there were the United Kingdom in the Old Testament broke into tw 12 tribes split, okay? Ten went to the north, that's Israel. Two tribes went to the south, that's Judah. And the Israel tribe, the Assyrians are above the Israel tribe, and they are going to come in, and they're vicious. They're going to attack and wipe out Israel, and God is sending these prophets to Israel to say, here, stop the destruction, and Hosea is one of the last prophets to speak to the nation of Israel. Okay, got that? Now, if you want to know what's in the book, okay, because you're going to study it this week, check it out right here, okay, what's in the book? The first three chapters are Hosea's… Oh, you want to try that again? First three chapters are Hosea's… Yeah, marriage, okay? And it's personal. It's about Hosea's love for an adulterous wife. Now, the next 11 chapters, the rest of the book, it's about Hosea's message, which is God's love for an adulterous people, and that's national. Now, what I want to do is this, because this is an expository series. I want to dive right into it. So, go to Hosea chapter 1 in your Bible, or go to the next page in here, okay? And we're going to walk this thing through. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to dig into this passage for a little bit, and then I'm going to pull some points out of it. But I got to make sure, are you all still with me? Yes. Good, because these verses will blow your mind. Check it out, okay? I titled chapter one, you want me to marry a what? Imagine this. You don't come, but your teenager comes. They come home today and say, you know what I learned at church? I'm supposed to marry a prostitute. <laughs> chapter one, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. And here's the marriage. When the Lord began to speak to, through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go, marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblam. Now, look up here for a second. Years ago, I, um, I became a Christian when I was age 18. Three years later, I go to the first Christian in university I've ever been to. I go to Azusa Pacific University. I register, and I'm an incoming junior, and I register. I made a mistake, and I registered for an upper division Bible class. Now, I don't know that much about the Bible because I've only been a Christian for three years. I've been studying it some, but I mean, I register for Old Testament prophets with old Dr. Hartley. And I walk into the thing on the first day, and he goes, all right, everybody. And my two best buddies are in this class with me. So we're all there, and he goes, okay, everybody, turn to the book of Hosea. Like 30 minutes later, I find it, okay? 
And then he reads these verses. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, go marry a harlot, and whose name is Gomer. And then he stops the class and goes, all right, it's Monday. You're a, you're, you have a paper due on Wednesday, and here's the paper. God always warns people to stay away from women like this. He tells a prophet to marry her. Did God really tell Hosea to marry a prostitute, or is it an allegory, or is it a story, or a, you got to take a position and write a paper? We debate this thing for two days. Now, I'm, I'm, this is so brand new to me, I actually wrote this paper. Here it is. I said, I'm not sure if God told him to marry a prostitute or not, but I'm pretty sure God would never tell a man to marry a woman named Gomer. <laughs> and I turned that paper in, and I did not do well in that class. Okay, back to the verses. Here we go. Okay? Now, Hosea and Gomer have three kids, okay? And the names get worse, okay? The first child, she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, and all three of these kids are going to be named to be messages to the nation of Israel. He says, call him Jezreel, which means what? Circle of phrase. In Hebrew, that means God scatters because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel, which happened in 722 BC. In that day, I will break Israel's bow, their military strength, in the valley of Jezreel. They have a second child. Gomer conceived again, probably not with Hosea, and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhamah, which means not love. Circle the phrase, not love, for I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Now, I want to pause right here and say this. I put this note in here on purpose, okay? If you're sitting here and you're going, whoa, 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 will, will God stop loving me? God's love is unconditional. He loves you at all times. However, you can walk away from Him and choose not to experience that love and that forgiveness. Make sense? Okay? And then, so that's the second child. First child is named, hey, God scatters. Second child is not, uh, your name's not loved. They have a third kid. Here it is. Okay? Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, call him Lo Ami, which means, circle of phrase, not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. God tells Hosea, I want you to have three kids. First kids, God's going to scatter you. Second kid is, you're no longer loved. And third is a message from God, you're no longer my people. Those are the three. That's a happy little family. Okay? Now, you know what's interesting? Just about the time you go, all hope's lost, hope breaks in. Check it out, verse 10. And it says this, Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. Remember that kid? Third kid. They will be called children of the living God. Then the people of Judah and the people of Israel will not be scattered, first kid, but they will come together and appoint one leader will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. And then, remember the person, not my people? Okay, third kid, say to your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, the second kid, not, not love, but you are now my loved one. Whole thing flips. That's just chapter one. Y'all still with me, by the way? Just check it. Okay, everybody here? Okay, good. Now, chapter two is a great chapter because of the balance. I, it's Heartbreak Hotel, basically. And the chapter, first half is God is holy. And the second chapter, the second part is God is love. And He promises His love and He pictures His love. So, first of all, God is holy. Now, look up here for a second. God gave everybody free will. You can, matter of fact, a, a teenager talked to me a while back, and this teenager was like, too cool for God, too cool for life, too cool for his parents. Do, do, you, just, you know anybody like this? Just too cool for his own good, you know? And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of walking away from God. My parents are a little shook up, but, you know, I'm walking away from God. Everybody that knows me is all shook up, but I'm walking away from God. I go, dude, go ahead. Fine with me. He's like, you're a pastor. And I go, yeah, you want to walk away from God? Go ahead. Fine with me. He's like, What? I was like, yeah, if you want to walk away with God, big deal to me. Now, you're going to screw up your life. You're going to wreck your life. You're going to go downhill. Because here's, I told the students, go, look, if you walk away from God, I don't lose. You lose. That's Hosea chapter 2. And what happens is God says, when you walk away from me, I just step back. 
And check it out. And there, verse 6, here's his, therefore, because you walked away from God, therefore, and look at all the bad stuff. Walk away from God, I'll block her path with thorn bushes, I'll wall her in, she can't find her way, you'll be without direction. Verse 7, I'll chase after her lovers but not catch them, you'll be relationally deprived. Verse 9, I will take away my grain when it ripens, you're going to go into economic hardship. Verse 10, I'll expose her lewdness. Verse 11, I'll stop all of her celebrations. Now, I know a lot of people want, I'm going to walk away from God, it's going to be more fun. It actually brings more heartbreak. Would you? Anybody have a testimony on this one? The um, verse 12, I will ruin her vines and her fig leaves. Verse 13, I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the bales and went after her lovers. Because here's the root problem. Because God says, because me, she forgot. Now, all of a sudden, it looks really bleak again, and it flips around. Check it out. But God says to the nation of Israel, there, He says to Hosea, here's what I'm going to say to the nation of Israel. Therefore, I am going to allure her. I will lead the nation into the wilderness, and I will speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards, and this is awesome. Get ready to circle this. And make the valley of Achor, circle that phrase, the valley of Achor. In the Hebrew, valley of Achor is the valley of trouble. When you walk away from God, the only thing you're really doing is going downhill and you're going to have a whole lot more trouble. Any, and by the way, it, the valley, it's a place of broken dreams, broken lives, broken finances, broken emotions. And God may have brought some of you here today because you're in that valley and you've been in there and you're going, is this all there is? Am I stuck? Am I trapped in this valley? Is there no way out? Is, is, in a, is it too late for me? Check this next phrase out. In the valley, I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. Is that awesome? In other words, in the valley, there's a door. Matter of fact, what is the door? Jesus, a couple thousand years later, said, I am the door. Okay. In the valley of Achor, there is a door of hope, and there she will respond as in the days of… God will restore your energy as in the day she came up out of it. And in that day, the Lord says, you will call me husband, and you will no longer call me master. God says, we're going to have a relationship with him. And just look up here for a second. This whole section, God is saying to them, I want to remind the whole nation of Israel, things are better when we're together, God says. How many of you go, yep, God's right, and at some point I didn't know it, but I know it now. Can anybody give a testimony on this one? Now, that's what God says to Hosea. That's how I'm going to treat the nation of Israel. Then He says to Hosea, now, here's how I want you to treat your wife. Check it out. Then the Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man, is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver. Here's what's happened. Just look at her. Uh, his wife, Gomer, has gone so far down, she's been sold into slavery, and Hosea has to buy her back for actually what's about, she's lost so much value, she's worth about half the price of a slave, and he still buys her back. By the way, doesn't that remind you of the cross? We are bought back, okay? And what's really going on here is this, and he goes, the key word to the book of Hosea is in the last verse there, go to verse 5, afterwards the Israelites will return, circle the word return. The word return is in the book of Hosea 22 times. It is the key word to the book of Hosea. Now, that's Hosea's marriage. Is everybody still with me, by the way? I know we're plowing through a lot of stuff, okay? Now, because this is going to be a starting point, you can read Hosea this week. Go to the next page. Check this out, okay? Hosea's message is God's love for an adulterous people. And this is his message to the nation. And all I'm going to do is give you an overview so you can read it this week. Chapters 4 and 5, God turns into a lawyer and says, here's my case. Bam. 6 and 7, he urges repentance, and then God is ignored, like he has ignored it a lot today. Okay, verse 8, 9, and 10, God says, if you're going to ignore me, there are some consequences, and here are seven snapshots that they would have understood of what these consequences looked like, and then Hosea always ends with hope, which I like. Chapters 11 
through 14 are the rebellious are restored, and God says God still loves His people, and here's three evidences that God has better days ahead for His people if they'll return to Him. God's mercies in the past, that's chapter 11. God's disciplines in the present, that's chapter 12 and 13, and God's promises for the future, and here's God's promises. The book ends with this. If you return to God, He will receive you back, He will restore you, and He will revive you, and then the past, be- the past becomes gone, and you got a brand new future ahead. This is an awesome book and a weird book. Chris Brown and I were talking about this book, and we were like, wouldn't it be incredible if somehow in the Old Testament somebody had a video camera and actually videoed Hosea and Gomer getting married? And wouldn't it be great if somehow that survived and we actually had a video clip of their marriage? And you know what's amazing? Chris and I found it. (laughs) Here it is. On behalf of Jose and Gomer, I want to thank all of you for being here today. In a very real way, you're not just listening, but you are participating in this marriage and the vows that are about to be taken. So, Jose, do you solemnly swear to take Gomer as your lawfully wedded wife, to live together in the holy covenant of marriage, to honor her, comfort, keep her in sickness and in health, in poverty and wealth, through hard times as well as good, keeping yourself faithful only to her, as long as you both shall live, if so, say, I do. I do. Now, Hosea, before we go on, do you fully realize that Gomer is a prostitute? It's not just who she was, <laughs> it's still what she currently does. And with that in mind, do you still pledge to marry this woman? I do. Hosea, do you understand that most of your marriage, she will live outside the home? She will spend her time, her trade, with men that you most likely will see on a daily basis. You will have kids, one will be your own, two probably aren't, and yet you will still assume the duty of raising them as a single parent without your wife at home, knowing what she does. Do you intend to take her as your wife? I really love this woman. I do. Gomer, do you intend to marry Hosea? Sure. By the power vested in me, because of the two covenants you've just entered, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Chris Brown has a suit. Who knew? That is exactly the picture painted in the book of Hosea. He's a minor prophet, but there are some major lessons. What are they? Glad you asked. Go to the back page, okay? There are four lessons, and really, the theme of Hosea in some ways is this. Return to the Lord, but the theme is this. Your life choices are going to echo for generations. And so he gives four major lessons about life choices. And the first one is this, unfaithfulness, whether you're Gomer or God or the nation or Hosea, unfaithfulness breaks relationships, okay? Unfaithfulness breaks relationships. Few things in life are more painful than being betrayed by somebody you love. And here's the promise. Most people think of unfaithfulness like, if I sin, oh, I broke a commandment, or I broke a law, or whatever, okay? And what they never realize is this. Sin, and write this down, sin is less about breaking laws and more about breaking God's hearts. Unfaithfulness is not about breaking laws, it's about breaking hearts. In other words, in a marriage, when someone is unfaithful, the problem isn't they've broken. In other words, if somebody's like, I'm married and whammo, I sleep around, all this kind of stuff, and I'm unfaithful, wrecks the family, the problem isn't, oh, they broke a commandment, or they ignored a social convention, or they've broken some arbitrary rule. No, that's not the problem. The real problem is this, they've devastated a relationship. They've devastated a relationship. They've brought darkness and brokenness and pain into something that was supposed to be safe and secure and a foundation for all kinds of things in the future. And what happens is unfaithfulness wrecks relationships in a home, in a friendship, and between you and God, okay? Unfaithfulness wrecks, breaks relationships. This girl put it like this. When I was 10, my parents got a divorce. Naturally, my father told me about it because, to be honest, he was my favorite. 
He said, honey, I know it's been kind of bad for you these past few days, and I don't want to make it worse, but there's something I have to tell you. Honey, your mother and I got a divorce. But daddy, I know you don't want this, but it has to be done. Your mother and I don't get along like we used to. I'm already packed and my plane's leaving in a couple hours. But daddy, why do you have to leave? Well, honey, your mother and I can't live together anymore. I, I know, but why do, you have to, why do you have to leave town? Oh, well, I've got somebody waiting for me in New Jersey. But daddy, will I ever see you again? Uh, sure you will, honey. We'll work something out. But what? I mean, you'll be living in New Jersey, and I'll be living here in Washington. Well, maybe your mother will agree to spending two weeks in the summer and two in the winter with me. What, well, Daddy, why, why not more often? Well, I, I don't think she'll agree to that, much less more. Well, Dad, you should try. It can't hurt to try. I know, honey. We'll work it out later. My, my plane leaves in a couple hours, and I've got to get to the airport. Now, I'm going to go, I'm going to get my luggage, and I want you to go to your room so you don't have to watch me leave. And no long goodbyes either. Okay, Daddy, goodbye. Don't forget to write, I won't. Goodbye. Now, go to your room. Okay, Daddy, but I don't want you to go. I know, honey, but I have to. Why? You wouldn't understand. Yes, I would. N no, you wouldn't. Oh, well, goodbye. Goodbye. Now, go to your room. Hurry up. Okay, well, I guess the, what's, that's the way life goes sometimes. Yes, honey, that's the way life goes sometimes. Then she wrote this last line. After my father walked out that door, I never heard from him again. Unfaithfulness devastates relationships. It's not about breaking little rules. It's about breaking hearts and wrecking lives. Lesson number two, major life lesson is this. Because of that, true covenant love between, in a marriage between you and God, true covenant love is absolutely exclusive. True covenant love is absolutely exclusive. I have never married anybody where the bride or the groom said, and I pledge to be faithful to you 80% of the time, okay? I mean, if somebody said that at an altar, what would you do? I'd be in the crowd going, run! Um, Kurt and I did a wedding yesterday. It was so cool. Um, Hannah Masterson and, Masterson and Jared, Pick Jared Pickerel got married. And what was really fun was, because Kurt and I are doing this together, and it's an outdoor wedding, kind of a fun setting, I snuck my iPhone up there, and I snapped some pictures, including the first ever picture I've taken of the bride and groom from a pastor's perspective as they're getting married. Everybody's attention was off somewhere else, so nobody even saw me take this picture. It was awesome. So I snap a picture of them. You want to see it? This is really cool. Let me take you to their wedding yesterday, right here. Isn't that awesome? Okay, and everybody's looking over there at something so I can, like, take pictures. And, and what's interesting is this. At a wedding, when I do the vows, you know, and it's stuff like, you know, do you, Jared, take this woman to be your wedded wife? And do you, Hannah, take this guy to be your slave for the rest of your life? You know, the, um, you know and it's like, with this ring, I went broke. The, um, and, and so when you do this kind of thing, the, you're doing this wedding, and when you do the vows, I slow down, and, and if you've heard me do a wedding, I slow down, and I get louder when I say this, and forsaking all others, keep yourself to her as long as you both shall live. Why? True covenant love is absolutely explicit. And you know what the problem? The problem in Israel, the problem in Israel was and I'm sure this is not happening in Americans with Christians. But the problem in Israel was this. Write it down. They were practicing faith. They were professing faith, but they were practicing faithlessness. They were professing faith, but they were actually practicing faithlessness. In other words, back then, God's people were claiming to have a relationship with God, but they felt, and they felt entitled to all the blessings, but... They were directly serving other gods, okay? In other words, they were serving Canaanite fertility gods and Baalism, which was the most morally corrupt and destructive cult to ever exist in history, utter defiance to everything God stood for. I want to give you, this quote is so good. I'm going to put it up, okay? Uh, Gary Smith wrote a book called The Prophets as Preachers, and he said this, shading, because some of you are looking at me going, hey, what do idols have to do with us here? We're in Northern California. 
He says this, shading the truth, cheating on a test, not bothering to tithe. Other acts of unfaithfulness to God doesn't seem to be as serious as prostitution. Yet God views all sin as unholiness, treacherous acts which undermine a relationship, a breaking of a love commitment to Him, a prostituting of our loyalties. You see, in spite of their great unfaithfulness, God loved the sinful people of the world so much, He willingly forgave their, and this is an awesome phrase, their acts of prostituting themselves to their own self-interest, to their own fame, to their own fortune, prostituting themselves to their own pleasures, to their own drugs, to their own work, to their own popularity, and to their own kingdom. In this sinful condition, of unfaithfulness. No qualities made people attractive. No good reasons explain God's love, but God still loved. The ugliness of sin exposed the exceeding greatness of the love of God. That's awesome. Now, some of you are going, wow, why is this stuff such a big deal? Write this next answer in. All of God's commandments are given to protect and provide. Every now and then, I'll run into somebody where they're going, how come there's so much stuff in the Bible you can't do? Why are that like, thou shalt, you got to do this, and thou shalt not, can't do that. Well, all this stuff in the Bible. And occasionally, you'll run into people, and I think most Californians probably think this. They're kind of looking at this going, you know what? All this stuff is so restrictive. It's cramping my style. And if I could just, and most people, here's what they think. If I could just get rid of all this stuff you're supposed to do, then I'd be free without all these rules and guidelines, all this kind of stuff. The problem is this. When you get rid of all of these kind of rules, you think you get freedom, you really get chaos. Some of you are going, what? What do I mean? Imagine this. At the end of this service, we have a massive volleyball game this side of the room against this side of the room, okay? And I play for this side of the room, and we all go out to Sierra College, and you're on one half, and I'm on the other half, and I get up and I say, you know what? Well ready for the volleyball game? Everybody cheers, and then I go, you know what? See these lines around the volleyball court? They're so limiting. It's so restrictive. It's so confining. Let's not have any rules for this game. Let's get rid of the line, and let's get rid of all rules, and we'll all have a whole lot more fun without all these stupid rules, and we'll enjoy the, we'll enjoy the game more. Everybody goes, yeah, that's it. Y'all go, yeah, that's great. And I go, okay, good. We're going to serve first, and y'all go, okay, we're ready. No lines, no nothing. I get a baseball bat, throw that volleyball up, and I smash that sucker halfway down Sierra College, and then I look at you and go, all right, one nothing, go get the ball. Who is staying around to play in that volleyball game? Why? Because when you get rid of guidelines, you do not get freedom and fun. You get chaos and a heartbreak and confusion reigns. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay? Third point is this. Okay? Hosea has a whole lot. It's really a book of romance. It's got a whole lot to say about the love of God, okay? And three characteristics of the love of God in the book of Hosea. Number one is this. God's love is a tough love. God's love is a tough love. They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind, okay? And what says, it is when, when, God, when Gomer says, I'm out, Hosea goes, go ahead. God always says, if you want to walk away from me, You have free will. You can do that, but you're going to experience all the consequences. Number two, God's love not only is a tough love, it's an unconditional love. It's an unconditional love. We give up on people, but God never gives up on people, okay? And third is this, God's love is a tough love, it's an unconditional love, and this is my favorite. God's love, because God loves so much, God's love will not permit Him to give up on His people. God has not given up on you. Hosea did not give up on Gomer. God did not give up on Israel. God's love. Stephen Curtis Chapman, this is such a great quote. I put it in your notes. He said, in the gospel, we discover we are far worse off than we thought, but we're far more loved than we ever dreamed. Isn't that a great quote? Great quote. Um, I got a phenomenal email from a guy the other day. And he had just, uh, he was reading the Hope Quotient, and this is exactly what he sent me. 
uncontrollable tears right now reading the Hope Quotient. Thank you for offering hope. Just by authoring the encouragement, here's one line got this, set this guy free. One line got to this guy, and here it is. It was when I wrote the words, stop listening to the voices of doubt and fear that tell you it's too late for you. God brought you here this morning because the book of Hosea, God says, even when you're in the valley of Achor and you're aching, God says, you know what? It is not too late for you. It is never too late to become the person God wants you to be. It is. Let me ask you a question. This will blow your mind. You're all ready for a, like a life-changing question? If you took this seriously, your future would be different. Here it is. What if, just what if, your best days spiritually are ahead of you, not behind you? What if your greatest God moments are in your future? What if, you're, what if God's greatest work in you and through you, what if you haven't had them yet, but it starts today, tomorrow, and the future? What if God's up there going, oh man, have I got some stuff? You know what? You read the Bible, your best days are in your future. Last point is this. God's love is tough, unconditional, but He never gives up. It's never too late. But He does say this. You can't delay. Time is running out. Come home. Time is running out, and the time to come home is right now. And he ends, I love, chapter 6, it's one of my favorite, these two verses are some of my favorite verses in the Bible. And God says to Hosea, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but He will heal us. He has injured us, but He will bind our wounds. After two days, He will revive us, and on the third day, He will restore us that we may live in His presence. Look up here and listen to this. There's a book called Mortal Lessons uh, authored by a physician named Richard Seltzer who describes a scene in a hospital room after he performed surgery on a young woman's face because she had a tumor. And he says these words, I stand by the bed where the young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of a facial nerve, one of the muscles on her mouth had been severed. She will be this way from now on. I had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut this little nerve, and she'll be like this forever. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to be in a world all their own in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself. He and this wry mouth that I have made who gaze at each other so generously. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this? Yes, I say it will. It's because I had to cut the nerve. She nods, tears up, and is silent. But the young man steps up. The young man smiles, and he says, I like it. It's kind of cute. And all at once, I realize who he is. And I understand, and I lower my gaze, because one is not bold in an encounter with a divine moment. And unmindful of me, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I am so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers, to show her that their kiss still works. Isn't that cool? That, this book of Hosea says, you and I are twisted. Doesn't have to stay that way. But the Bible also says, Jesus was twisted on a cross so that you and I could be forgiven and feel the kiss, the embrace of God. And Hosea's main message is this. God loves you more than you thought. It's time to come home. Would you bow your heads right now? Close your eyes right now. 
and shut everybody out around you right now. Nobody moves. Just close your eyes. God maybe brought you here today because you've been in that valley and you need to hear the words of Hosea 6. Come, let us return to the Lord. Your best days are in your future. Jesus, God says, come back to me. Walking away from me is not worth it. It'll just lead you to a valley of more and more trouble. And if you're here this morning saying, man, I want to return to God. I, I am sick and tired of being in that valley. I want to take the door out. And it's a door of hope. If you're going, I want to know I'm forgiven. I want a clean slate. I want a fresh start. I want Christ in my life. I want to live in the presence of God, on the power of God every day. That can happen to you right here, right now, right today. And I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. I just think I'll pray it out loud. You can pray with me silently. But man, I would plead with you, the message of Hosea is return to a God who loves you even when you didn't think he loved you anymore. So come back to him. If this is what you need, pray with me right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I return to you this morning. Please forgive me for all my sin. I believe you died on a cross and rose, which means you're right here. So right now, I let the past go. I ask you to invade my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Make me the person you want me to be. I give you my faith, my life, my future. Take control. Thank you for your love. And if you prayed that prayer, keep your eyes closed. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you, but if you prayed that prayer, I would love to pray for you that the rest of your life, you walk out of that valley through the door of hope, and God's got better days ahead. So if you prayed that prayer right now, would you raise your hand? Just put them way up. I mean, there's a ton of you. Put them way up. Awesome. Way to go. If you're nervous to put them up, put it up now. Oh, way to go. Sometimes it takes courage to authentically walk with God. We have a table on the front right-hand side. It just says, I raised my hand. After the service, you can go to that table. And they got some great free stuff to give you. And Kurt's going to pray for you right now. Awesome. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every decision that was made this weekend. God, it really is time to return to you. Help us walk that decision out. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said.